Welcome, Mindsetters, to this lesson for Grade 10's Life Science. I'm here with the beautiful Kathy, who will mm. be taking you through the lesson, and she's actually going to explain a little bit of what we've been doing lately. Okay, well, listen, people, I'd like to welcome Ty. He's going to be linking us and, uh, for the Grade 10 sessions. Um, so, Ty, welcome. You thank know, you, thank and you. so I don't know when last you were at school, but you look like you should <laughs> still be at school. It doesn't even look young girls. I mean, like I know all the girls out there are going to be having an absolute frothy. <laughs> but uh, okay, as far as last week's session for the grade tens was concerned, we did cell division, guys. I hope you remember we did um, the whole mitosis process and how it all works. We're now going to be dealing with plant and animal tissue, and the biggest issue here is going to be that you need to distinguish them. So um, next week. Remember, please, just, just as a revision session, really, and we're going to be doing any, everything and anything from molecules to cells to tissue, and we're going to go through all of that in the lesson anyway. So just make sure that you are paying attention next week. And Ty, he, he's waiting for your <laughs> questions, okay? So please, girls, don't ask for dates. He's not available, but send us questions, all right? See you guys after the break. Welcome back, Mindsetters, to Grade 10 Life Science with the lovely Kathy here. She'll be taking you through today's lesson. So guys, make sure you get those questions in. Facebook me, tweet me so I can chat to you, so you can chat to me. Make sure you guys go to the page and talk to each other, help each other out. And make sure you guys keep talking, talking, talking. Make sure you hit facebook.com forward slash learn extra and tweet me at learn extra. I'm going to hand over to Kathy right now and she'll be taking us from here. Thanks, Ty. Okay, people, remember mitosis is when my toes grow. So it is for growth, repair, replacement, and then sexual reproduction in unicellular organisms. One cell, they've got nothing else. They've only got their cell. They have to use mitosis or what we call binary fission to reproduce. Okay, remember interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And interphase is the phase in between. So it's not actually a phase, it's the prep phase. All right, so today we go to plant and animal tissue. Now remember, we start off with cells. All these different types of cells and they all have a specific shape and that they, they look a certain way and they have certain things in the cell. Why? Because the structure is responsible for the function. So you've got all these different little cells. Now, I mean, think of our bodies. We've got cells all over the show. These lip cells are not the same as the cells inside your mouth, for example, or the cells in your eye, for example. So we have all these different types of cells, and your biggest issue is going to be to distinguish them. If I was setting a test for you, I would give you a set of about 10 different diagrams of different cells and then ask you to identify the cells and tell me what they do, where they found, what they do. So that's how you must learn it. Make a table, take two A4 sheets, stick them together and do a table and then just do a very basic diagram like the ones I have here so that you can recognize those cells. All right, so here we go. Plant and animal tissue. Yay, yay, yay. Now, first thing I wanted you to look at was this, okay? This is the process. We're going to start with a little cell. And the little cells are now going to undergo mitosis, which we've done. So we're going to go from one cell to two cells. Those two cells are going to duplicate to four cells. Remember, in mitosis, we end up with two identical daughter cells. Each time mitosis takes place, it's two identical daughter cells, okay? Then we go on to now the cells have duplicated. Now they are going to grow and they literally grow in size, okay? So we've got the little cell. It's going to get bigger. It's going to get bigger. When it has fully grown, the cell is now going to undergo what we call differentiation. Okay, now people, look at this word, different. Now when something is different, it means it is not the same as another. If you look at Ty, Ty's a human being, I'm a human being, but we are different. 
all right? Um, first of all, he's male and I'm female. Big difference. All right, so differentiation. Look at the word differentiation. So differentiation means that the cell, that's now an adult cell, is now going to differentiate. It's going to become different. For our learners that are watching that are English second and third language, some of the words we use in, in life sciences can be really hard. Always try to break the word up into simple pieces, all right? Very often, the first part of the word will tell you what it is, and then it's just the process. For example, if we look at photosynthesis, you know that photo means light, and synthesis means to make. So, hello, it's a plant using light to make food. You follow, so, so you can suss it out. Just learn and look at the words and break them up. And differentiation is a term you must know. All right, so it's to become different. So once we now have the cell, here's our adult cell, and the cell is now fully grown. When I put adult, I'm going to put it in inverted commas. Then the cell is now going to start, let me put here, then, it will start to differentiate. So here it can become an epidermal cell or a root hair or a chloroplast, but it changes. All right, now we look at our plant tissue and this grouping is something you need to know. So all plant tissue, I'm going to move that over, you know this is plant tissue, is divided into two groups. Let's get my white here or my bright yellow. Okay, we've got two groups. You've got meristematic tissue, and that is a mouthful. So you're going to break it up. You're going to go, Mary, it's Mary, it's happy. Okay, Mary, stem, attic. Meristematic tissue. Now, what is meristematic tissue? It's brand new cells that grow. So it's going to be wherever we have growth in a plant. Now, where do we have growth in a plant? Now, if you just use your common sense, and think, we have the roots grow down into the soil and the stem grows up and the side branches grow sideways. So where do you think we're going to have all the growing, all the growing points? Is at the tips of all the stems, all right, and the tips of the roots. And then if you look at springtime, what do we have? What grows into those beautiful flowers all over the trees? It is little buds. So you'll have meristematic tissue in those little buds as well as they then grow and open up, all right? And also grow into new stems. All right, so we've got the apical Mary stem, which is at the tip of the stems, and the lateral Mary stem, and that's going to be at, to cause a tree, a wooden tree, to grow bigger and bigger in its girth. So lateral means sideways, so lateral Mary stem to make the tree have secondary thickening. All right, and you'll do secondary thickening in grade 11. Now, permanent tissue. So this is the growing tissue, this is to grow, okay? And permanent tissue is the tissue that helps this plant to survive. And we're going to go through each one of them, but let's just look. We've got the epidermis on the outside. It always covers, just like our epidermis. Look, what's this? This is an epidermis. You all know your skin is your epidermis, right? Your skin is your largest organ in your body, and it's, this is your epi. It's on the outside. We also have epidermal cells, just by the way, in, in animal cells on the inside that lines anything that comes into contact with outside. So your digestive system, your respiratory system, all of that will be lined with epidermal cells. All right, then we've got the flow, which transports water and mineral salts. Just briefly, we've got the xylem that transports water. So this will go, the flow is up and down the plant. The xylem is only up the plant. We've got the parenchyma tissue, which is like supporting tissue. We've got the chlorenchyma, well, that's got the chloroplasts. Cholenchyma, strong, so it's for support and strength. And then the sclerenchyma, which is really for strength. 
Alrighty, now let's look at our different cells. The first one we're going to do is Mary stem attic tissue. Okay, it is the tissue that is going to undergo my mitosis because that is going to be found at the growing tips of the roots and the stems. Now, if you look at these cells, they've got a basic shape. They're very uh, um, flat. They, they are simple, simple little cells. And look, the nucleus, let's get a, the nucleus is large. Why? Because it's just undergone Cell, cell division, because it's making new cells all the time. Otherwise, how does it grow? Okay. This is a micrograph, which means a photo that was taken of a microscope slide, and this is your micrograph of meristematic tissue. So, if you see here, you can actually see there's... Uh, let's get another color here... Um, there, you've got anaphase going on. Here, you've got all, this, all the uh, um, chromosomes lined up at the center. So that tells us that's metaphase, etc., etc. And when you see something like this, you know this is because there's a whole bunch of growth taking place. And the growth is because of cell division called mitosis. Next one. Okay, now we're going on to the permanent tissue. And this permanent tissue, first one, is our epidermis. Now, how are we going to distinguish this? First of all, the, 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 the cells are all packed together. There are no intercellular air spaces. Okay, there are no intercellular air spaces. It's only one layer that we can see here. What does that tell us? It's there to protect. So where will we find this? Think, where will we find the epidermal tissue? Correct, on all your green stems, okay, because we know that when the stems have secondary thickening, they're going to have bark. Right, so we're going to have all green stems, we're going to have it on the leaves, we're going so and we're also going to find epidermal tissue in the roots, but that's a very special epidermal tissue because this one here shows us. I don't know if you can see this. I'm going to color it in here and make it thicker. Okay, you have a cuticle. And that cuticle is only if it is on the stem, clearly of green stems. I'm going to put in brackets green. And on the leaves. Now, why would we have a thick waxy cuticle on leaves? Why? Uh, to prevent transpiration, to prevent too much water loss from the plant. So that waxy cuticle is there to make sure it keeps the water in the plant. Right, next one. Okay, this is the other type of epidermal tissue that we have. This is called a root pair. All right, now, do you recall that I told you about an increased surface area? So, all the grade 10s pay attention. I've got my umbilical cord. You see my umbilical cord here behind me? Hmm. Okay. If I take 30 centimeters of this wire, and I've got to fit this into one centimeter, look, I simply put a fold in it. Now, that one centimeter equals 30 centimeters, which means in this space, I can put 30 of these, which means we increase the surface area. So whenever there is a fold of any kind, it means the surface area is increased. So, if we look at that root here, if this is a normal root, okay, 
That's a root growing down into the ground. Okay, this is a lateral root. All right, there's your lateral root. Now, what I'm interested in is this part here. Right around the tip of this lateral root, we have what's called a root cap. And that just slimes off. It's slimy cells, and they just slither off as the root grows into the ground, as it grows downwards. Okay? The next region that you have here is what we've discussed right in the beginning, is our mirror stomatic tissue. Or we can say meristematic region, meristematic cells is about there. So the new cells are being made. Now, once they've been made, the new cells, we have another region here. And this region is where differentiation occurs. So this origin of elongation... In other words, that's where the cells get longer, and I've just thrown my whole thing away here. <laughs> Sorry. All right. And then we have an area that's got a whole bunch of little things that stick out like this. And I'm sure your teachers have made you do an experiment where you grow bean seeds. All right. And when you take those bean seeds, you put them in, in co between cotton wool, and you put them in a nice, warm, dark place. And when those little new roots start to come out, it's called a radical. When you look at that, you'll see these tiny little fluffy things at the end, like cotton wool. That is your rooty region. All right. Now. We go back to our slide here, and I've got like two minutes before we go to ad break, so we're going to do this quickly. Okay? Look here. Look what you've got. You've got one cell that does this. There's your cell. All right? They're the neighboring cells, and then you'll have another root hair growing along here like that. All right. Most important part here is you see the increased surface areas that grows out. Okay, this is all vacuole. So it's got this very long vacuole. Now, with the root hair, number one, it has no cuticle. Because if it had a cuticle, remember, a cuticle is a waxy layer. It means water wouldn't be able to get in there. And this is how a plant absorbs 80% of its water, is in that little tiny region. So, no cuticle. Number two, it has an increased surface area. Okay, number three, it has a large vacuole. And remember, that vacuole is filled with cell sap. And that cell sap is going to change the water potential so that water always moves from outside the soil into the root hair. Okay, um, okay it's got a large nucleus here. Uh, and yeah, those are your three most important factors that you must know. Oh, and it has a very, sorry, I'm going to write number four here, a very thin cell wall. Now, why would it have a very thin cell wall? Well, it has a cell wall because it's a plant cell. You know that, hey? And secondly, it's thin. Why? Because you want the water to get in quickly and easily. You don't want a thick cell wall, you want a thin one. So, four factors. Okay, with regard to a root hair that you must know. This is NB personified. Very important. Number one, no cuticle. Number two, increased surface area. Number three, large vacuole which contains cell sap so that we maintain the water potential. So water keeps coming in. And lastly, thin cell wall. Why? We want the water to get in easily. People, I was setting a test. I would ask you the structure versus function of a root hair. You need to know what it is and why it does what it does. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Ty. So guys, as you heard, make sure you're making notes, you're writing this down. And guys, again, Facebook me, tweet me, chat to me. This is for you. So guys, we're going to take a quick ad break and we'll be back just now. Welcome back, Mindsetters. Today is grade 10 life science. So guys, make sure you have your pens out, your pads out, you're making notes, and the lovely Kathy is going to be taking us through this lesson. And Kathy, I'll hand it straight back to you. 
Thanks, Ty. Okay, people, we now go on to, again, permanent tissue. This is parenchyma. Okay, so it's parenchyma cells that we can see here, or parenchyma tissue, but parenchyma cells. And what these parenchyma cells are doing, I mean, look at the, I'm going to just change colors here. Look at this nucleus, it's normal size. It's got a relatively good cell wall over here. Nicely done there. Um, there you've got your cytoplasm, the little cells, but what's very special about these cells is, look at this. You see these big areas here in black here? Those mean that it has mega, and you're not going to be able to see that, but huge intercellular, which means between the cells, intercellular air spaces. All right, so those huge intercellular air spaces means that water can move through them. It means that gases can move in and out between these cells, so it helps to, to pass the gases and the water along, but also your parenchyma cells store starch. So the glucose that's produced in the leaves gets transported via the phloem to the parenchyma tissue where it gets stored as starch. All right, next one that we're going to do, let's just take this down. Okay, where's my green? I'm going to go like this, and then you'll know what this is. They are exactly the same as parenchyma cells, but they're slightly modified, and they contain plenty of chloroplasts. So because they have all these chloroplasts, this tissue is called chlorenchyme. So it's like a cross between parenchyma with chloro uh, um, chloroplasts. So it's called chlorenchyma. Where will you find chlorenchyma? Come think. You'll clearly find it in green stems, all right, so your, your herbaceous plants, but you'll also find it in all the leaves on a plant. All right, chlorenchyma. Next. Oh, and their main function, by the way, their main function is going to be photo synthesis using the light to make food okay this is a picture of parenchyma tissue you can see there's no color really but this is what it looks like in real life okay then we move on to okay this here has pectin and that's how it, now look at the difference and i need for you to look at because this is where learners get confused no man I need to move this pen behind me. Okay, look at the size here of the cell wall and look at the size here. All right, here you can still see the cells and the nucleus, which means the cells are alive. They're still living, whereas these cells are non-living. Okay, now think, just use your common sense. If it's got pectin, which means that substances can move through, you, it must be able to move through because you've got a nucleus. And the nucleus means that this cell is still alive. These cells here are called cholenchyma. Cholenchyma. And cholenchyma's function is for strength, for support, but also, you know when you eat a pear, and you know the texture of the flesh of a pear? It's like uh, um, what we call stony. That's because of the stone cells. All right? Or you've got um, the... the uh, uh, and I've, I've just gone blank. But you've got like fibers. And those fibers, you know when you eat a pear, you get a bit of stuff stuck in between your teeth and stuff? Now, that's what rope is made of. Not out of pears, but out of the cholenchyma in trees and, and certain plants. And your sisal plants. All right? Now, if we look at this one, this is, has lignin, and this is sclerenchyma. Sc and this is sclerenchyma, and sclerenchyma is completely non-living. It's got these thick, thick, thick cell walls, and these thick cell walls are made of lignin, and lignin, by the way, is waterproof. 
Ah, with an R, waterproof. So nothing gets in there. It is purely for support and strength. And you're going to find sclerenchyma around the vascular bundles in plants that are herbaceous so they don't fall over. Okay, you also find it in the veins on a leaf. You know, if you take a leaf and you dry it and all the tissue breaks off and you have like this network of veins, it's the sclerenchyma that keeps everything in place. The sclerenchyma and actually the xylem as well to a lesser extent. Okay, and I've got to get a jerk on here because I'm... All right, here's a micrograph of sclerenchyma. How do we know it's sclerenchyma? Look there. It's completely stained black and that's all the lignin that your cell walls are all nice and big. And look, you can't see any nuclei here. I mean, there's no nucleus here. There's no one there. No, 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 no nucleus, which means it is non-living. All right, then we carry on. This is, and you have to be able to recognize this, it is your xylem. Now, look at the xylem. You've got very strong or thick cell walls. These cell walls are filled with lignin, the same as you had for your sclerenchyma. All right? They long, narrow tubes because the cells have no cross walls. What that means is that, you know how you've normally got cells that go down like this? What's happened here is this cell wall is thickened, this one has thickened, and you've got no man. Ah, I want rubber. There are no cross walls. So the cell, it's like one long, narrow tube. It's like sucking through a straw. And that's why the xylem works like it does. Thick cell walls, thickened with lignin. they long, continuous, straw-like, non-living structures. Because there's nothing in there. The cells don't have nuclei or cytoplasm or anything. What is the main function of the xylem? Come think. It's to transport water from the roots all the way up the stem to the tippy-tippy leaf. And, and, I mean, some trees are like 30, 40, 50, 80 meters high, and it's sucking that water up because of the xylem vessels. Okay, and then we go down to the phloem. Now, how, what is important about the phloem? Phloem tissue, these things here are sieve plates. Okay, so this, I'm going to do it like that. That there is a sieve plate. And what's happened here is that you've got sort of a hollowing out of the cell. Uh, there isn't really much cell contents left anyway. There's no nucleus in the actual phloem cell, right? You've got cytoplasmic strands, and then you've got like a holy, like a, a, um, a sieve at the end where the cell should have been. Okay, where the cross wall would have been. And then next to it, you've got a little thing here called a companion cell. And that little companion cell has a nucleus. And the companion cell makes sure that your phloem cells are supported. All right. But what is the function of the phloem? It is to transport water and mineral salts and nutrients, okay? And I'm saying nuts, nutrients, nutrients, up and down the plant, where xylem only transports water in one direction. Phloem is like our sort of arteries and veins. It transports in both directions. Okay. And this is just a slide. There you have... This is what a slide looks like of xylem. Okay, here you can see how wonderfully long and beautiful these little straw-like structures are. And there is a diagram of your phloem cells. There's your sieve plate. And let's see, can we see, I think this here would be over here. It would be a little cell, a companion cell, and there's a little companion cell over there. All right, animal tissue. Sure, we're going fast. Guys, any questions, all right, and anything you're confused about, please email Ty, I mean email Ty, email him, Facebook him, tweet him, tweet, yes, tweet, tweet Twitter, tweet. Yes. <laughs> um, be a twit and tweet, okay? But 
tweet, all right, just make sure you know what the things look like versus what they do. And that is what you're going to be asked in an exam. And to be able to recognize them. All right, animal tissue. Now, animal tissue, I'm not such a, fond, I'm not such a big fan of plants, but I am of animals. All right, we're looking at epithelial tissue on the top. This covers connective tissue. Well, people, what do you think connective tissue does? It will connect. And then we get muscle tissue. Ah, look. Can we go without muscles? No. But you're only thinking about these muscles. We've got special muscles in the heart, which are called cardiac muscle. And we have very special muscle for all our organs, which is smooth muscle. And then we have nerve tissue. You must know sensory neurons take information from your senses to your, your spine and your brain, your central nervous system. And your motor neurons is, if, for example, I, I'm itching, um, my sensory neurons have taken that message to my brain, but my motor neurons are going to cause these muscles to contract so that I can scratch. You follow? So your motor neurons are from the nervous system to, or the central nervous system, brain, spinal cord, to your muscles. And your sensory neurons are from your senses to your central nervous system. But we'll do more of that just now. Okay, let's go through each of them. Now remember what I said. Same as with plants, your epithelial tissue always lines any part that um, works with the outside. Now that's actually oversimplifying it, but for example, this is our first type of epithelial tissue and it's called squamous. And squamous epithelium is, and you call it squamous epithelium, it lines. So it lines, for example, your mouth. And if you have microscopes at school, ask your teachers, and you take your nail, or a, I suppose it's more hygienic to use a clean toothpick, scrape a piece of your, just the inside of your mouth. You don't have to even make a hole. You just scrape the top of your surface of your skin in your mouth. You tap it onto a slide stain it and have a look at it and that's squamous epithelium so squamous epithelium also be in the lungs because it's a very thin layer if we look at it from the side if you look at it from the side you've got your base membrane and then you've got your squamous epithelial cells are here like that they're very thin so they allow for easy diffusion okay so any place where you need uh, um, movement of substances quickly, you're going to have squamous epithelium. And in our mouth, we have hundreds of layers of squamous epithelium. All right? That's why if you take, um, you know when people do homeopathic medicines, what do they do? They put it under their tongue and it's absorbed into the, from the saliva into the, the, the tissue in the mouth through the squamous epithelium. Okay? Then these here, you're going to find in your digestive system, these are called your columna epithelium. Uh, now, look at it. I mean, it's really not that hard to see why they're called columna. They look like little columns. They're long and stretched out here. Look. They're nice and long and stretched out. The nucleus is always at the bottom. And then you've got this little cell here. And that little cell is called a goblet cell. And its job is to make mucus. Now, think. Where are we going to have these kind of cells? We're going to have them in the small intestine. We're going to have them down the track here. We're going to have them anywhere where we are producing mucus. All right. So your columnar epithelium, easy diffusion as well. Because if you look, they're just one layer thick. They're not 25 million layers, one layer, which means easy diffusion in and out. Okay, now, remember the column epithelium? This is column epithelium with little hairs. All right, so we're not doing, and I, I know my diagrams are really bad, but uh, yeah, this is not a potato man. All right, so look here. These little hairs are called cilia. 
And what the cilia do is they move things along. So it's sort of modified column epithelium. It's got the cilia. And where would we have this? Well, think about it. We have it in the sperm ducts in males. And you'll learn lots about that when you get to grade 12. It moves the little spermies along. And it creates it gives a bit of mucus and, you know, everything moves along. In the females, we've got it in the oviducts or the fallopian tubes to move the little eggs along the fallopian tube. Otherwise, how are they going to move? And so they move things along. You will also have that in your, behind the back of your nasal cavity and into your trachea, uh, 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 your trachea, as well as in the bronchi and the bronchioles. Why? Because we want any particles, any dust particles, any things that don't belong in the air to be caught up there. When people smoke, this is a baddie, those cilia break off. And when they break off, that's when people start with their smokers, coughs, and their, you know, all that nonsense, because there's nothing to filter out all those bad particles, and it's the cilia's job to do it. And then the mucus, there's your goblet cell. And what is the goblet cell's job? It is to make sure that there's mucus, so whatever's trapped on those cilia can be, get out, you get it out of the body. Okay, so... Your, uh, I never wrote this word, the, the name down, so we're going to take this up. This is ciliated columnar epithelium. All right, ciliated columnar epithelium. Here, look at these. They have a cube shape. Now, the fact that they've got a cube shape gives us our name. They are called cuboidal. And what kind of cell tissue are they? They are still epithelium. Ah, All right? Cuboidal epithelium, large nucleus, they're cube shape. Here's your base membrane over here. It's in black, so you won't be able to see it. There's the base membrane, and they have a lot of mitochondria. Why? For active transport. So they help with active transport they produce, and you'll find this in the tubules of the kidney, for example. Right, and I think I've got time for one more before we go to ad break. Um, this is a, this is your glandular epithelium. Now, glandular epithelium, clearly, it looks like a gland, right? So what have we got? We've got the little cells. Here is the secretion that it's producing, and this oozes out over there. Now, what would glandulars, where would we find them? We'd find them in the skin, in the salivary glands. We'd find them in mammary glands to produce milk. Um, we'd find them just about anywhere where hormones are produced. Because all your glands that produce hormones are going to have glandular cells. It's the only way to produce the hormones that are required. Okay, so anything that's going to give you a useful secretion. Remember, excretions are bad, okay? Secretions are good. And that's where sweat becomes a problem because sweat is bad because it's rubbish that we, we get out of our skins, so it's an excretion. But we have sweat, which cools us down, so therefore it's useful, so it could also be classified as a secretion in that way. Over to you, Ty. Well, guys, I hope you're paying attention. Like... Kashifa, who's on the page as usual. Hi, Kashifa, how are you doing? <laughs> so, guys, keep chatting on the page, keep talking, keep talking. It's a little quiet today, which is a bit saddening, but guys, keep talking, keep talking. That's the point of why this is, platform is here for you. And we're going to take a quick ad break and we'll be back right now. Welcome back, Mindsetters. As I said before, I hope you're making notes. I hope you're writing down. It's a bit quiet on the page, so guys, keep talking to each other. If you are understanding, just give us a nods up on the page so we know, so we can either slow down or speed up, or if you guys are okay. I'm going to hand it back to Kathy, who's going to continue with the show. Cool. Thanks, Ty. Okay, people, that was epithelial tissue, all right? Squamous epithelium, and we had columnar epithelium. We had ciliated columnar epithelium. We had cuboidal cells. We had glandular cells. Okay, make sure that you know those cells. A4, two A4s, 
and do a table. All right, write the tissue down, do a little diagram where you find it, what it does, and you do the same, and you do this little table for yourself. Stick it up on the fridge. Before you're allowed to take anything out of that fridge, you have to read your table, or at least one column of your table, or behind the toilet door. And I know this sounds revolting. It's probably the best place to put something that you want to learn from because you sit there mindlessly and you can then read it. All right, so you almost learn by osmosis. Um, I wish, but okay, here we go. Now we start with our connective tissue. These are things that connect. So here we've got our white fibrous tissue. It's a shock absorber. Um, it's for, for anywhere where you're going to have shock absorbing. So in your spinal cord, for example, between the, the vertebra of the spinal cord, you will have white fibrous cartilage. It's, it sits there. There it is. All right, why? Because it's a shock absorber. You'll have it lining the bone cavities, for example, here in your, um, where the femur head fits into the hips. Um, your tendons, now it's sort of flexible, um, it, it, but it, do, it doesn't stretch. It's flexible. You can't, if you try and flex a tendon too far, it's the muscle that's stretching. You will actually tear the tendon. So it is, it is flexible. Okay, um, then we go on here to the yellow elastic, cartl uh, yellow elastic cartilage. It's strong, very strong. But if you look here, here are your elastic fibers. There they are, all right? And those yellow elastic fibers help to make it uh, um, sort of movable, flexible, and what's important, it is very, very strong. Oh, yeah, yeah, I need another color here. It's very strong. It is flexible because, I mean, look here. If I take my finger and I take it and I bend this as far as it can go, or I bend it as far as it can go here, it can still bend. It's sort of flexible, okay? And this is, we're going to have ligaments. So remember, your white fibrous is for tendons, and your yellow elastic is for Ligaments. Ligaments hold bone to bone, all right, and tendons hold muscle to bone. And then also your epiglottis, swallow. I want you all to swallow. Put your fingers here on your throats, okay, and you know where your Adam's apple is? Feel it. Now swallow. And you feel that it goes up when you swallow and then it goes back and up and back. That little flap that closes your air pipe or your windpipe proper name is trachea, it closes the trachea like this. And when you swallow, it goes zhoops, and that makes your Adam's apple go up, and then it does this. That epiglottis is made up of your yellow elastic cartilage. Also, believe it or not, the pinna of your ear. Now, if you feel your ears, they're quite wiggly woggly, but they're still firm, and they go back to where they're supposed to be. Uh, all right, cartilage. This is just plain cartilage. This is very strong, it's, but it's very flexible. Take your hands on your ribs. Come, Ty, you can do it too. This is, you gotta, this is biology. This is biology 101. And you go, push in your ribs. Can you feel that they move? Mm -hmm. And now let go. Or just put your hands on your ribs and breathe. And you feel your rib cage goes up and it goes down. You've also got your sternum, also made of cartilage. So all the cartilage that you're going to find in your trachea, Ah, feel here. Come, Ty, you can feel as well. You got the little round rings here. Can you feel them? Now, those little rings of, of, of the trachea are there. They're C-shaped cartilage rings. And what they do is they make sure that your trachea stays open. I mean, can you imagine if your trachea folded closed like a straw? Um, it can't. It's, it, it, you would suffocate. So we've got to make sure the trachea is always open. But the esophagus, which is where your food goes down, sits right behind the trachea. So it must be C-shaped. So when you swallow, remember the epiglottis. I can, I can see Ty is paying attention here. <laughs> the epiglottis has closed. So your windpipe is closed so that the, the esophagus can go open and, and, and stretch into the trachea. So you have your, it's, if this is the trachea, you have C-shaped cartilage rings around it like that. Okay? Also your ribs, we've said, and then all your joint ends. Now remember people, um, you, go into, you did synovial joints, and when you do those synovial joints, where the two bones meet, 
so that they don't rub each other silly, because remember, bone is quite hard. You have this, this just normal cartilage around it. Okay, um, now carry on, and we've got bone tissue. Ah, now I'm going to, this is going to be fun and games. I'm going to take the purple. All right. First of all, this here is called a cement line. Okay, and there's your cement line. All right, what it does is it separates the bone tissue around, so it's in little circle structures like this. What we've got is, you see these little green, the, okay, I'm doing them in green, these little black things here, they are called lacuna. And a lacuna is like a little cavity. And sitting inside that little cavity, we are going to have an osteocyte. And an osteocyte is the little, just little tiny cell that makes bone. All right, so you've got your lacuna, and in this lacuna here, we have an osteocyte. Now we've got to get them to talk. So how do we get them to talk? Let me see what other yellow. Okay, how do we get them to talk? You see these things that are in dark lines here like that? And they sort of connect the little lacuna together. Those little dark lines are what are called, and I've got no space to write here, um, those little dark lines are called the caniculi, the caniculi, and they're like little canals, they're like miniature canals, so that there is a sharing of nutrients and fluids and what, what, what between these little osteocytes, the little cells that are in the bone. And what have I missed out? Oh, and now this big round thing that you see over there, all right? The big black pit over here, that's called the Haversian Canal. And the Haversian Canal's job is for blood vessels. Okay, so you've got a little arteriole bringing oxygenated blood and nutrients, a venule going off, which is carrying the carbon dioxide and nonsense away, and you've also got nerves. Okay, that's why it's so sore when you break a bone. It is painful, painful, painful. So people, I'm going to leave it there. Next week, we've got an hour to do revision. I'm going to go through the blood with you and then nerve tissue. All right, we just didn't get through it and I can't go any faster because I can't talk faster. So have a good one. Enjoy your week. Work hard. And remember to revise your work. Over to you, Ty. Yes, I actually had one quick question that I yeah. wanted to ask. Like Anella is dying to find out, is dermal tissue similar to the epidermis? Yes, it's the whole, it, it's, it's whatever's on the top. So you're going to have your epidermis as the top. Epi means on top. Dermis will be just below that. All right, awesome. So guys, hope that was helpful. Make sure you guys keep writing those notes. Keep writing on the page. Talk to each other. I'm seeing a lot of activity on the page. A lot of the kids are helping out with each other. Awesome, awesome job, guys. I can't, I can't say this enough. Guys, just keep going at it. Keep writing, keep messaging, and we'll be back with the next lesson for grade 12. Grade Cheers. 11s, actually. Grade 11. Cheers, guys. Cheers.